All right, then let's uh, let's take our request to our God and ask him to bless our time together tonight. Uh, Heavenly Father, you hold the world in your hands. You know each and every one of us, how many hairs are on our head, and you know how to give us what's best in our lives. Uh, please be with us and bless us tonight so we can learn more about your word and continue to grow. Uh, Lord, also be with Catherine right now, who's going through some hardship, and give all of us patience and wisdom as we strive to trust in you and in you alone. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, welcome back to our study of First Kings. We're going to be on chapter 14 tonight. I'm sorry to interrupt. My, oh, yeah. name, my name is Katharina. Oh, Katharina. Okay. Katharina. Yes. Great clarification. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so tonight we'll be in First Kings chapter 14. Who will briefly review the last few chapters of First Kings, where we've been? That's okay, kind of a tough question. So uh, in First Kings, we, we looked at the uh, beginning of Solomon's reign, and Solomon, he asks for wisdom. And then after that, he's going to build the wonderful temple to the Lord. He'll build his palace. And then we heard how Solomon started to go a little bit in the wrong direction. Uh, he started marrying lots of women that turned his heart from the Lord, he started worshiping idols. Um because of this, God tells Solomon that he's going to take the kingdom from his hands, and instead he's going to give it to someone else. Um, he, God, God sends a prophet to a man named Jeroboam, tells Jeroboam you're going to get the ten northern tribes of Israel. Um, Jer this, this all takes place after Solomon's death, but then Jeroboam is also wicked along with um, Solomon's son Rehoboam, and kind of walked through some of the horrible things they did. One of the main key points is Jeroboam sets up two golden calves in Israel to worship instead of worshiping the Lord. Um, and uh, a prophet comes to him and points out his sin. And uh, we see some interesting interplay in chapter 13 is Jeroboam's hand. Uh, something happens to it and then the prophet prays for him, heals him. And that's kind of where we're at. Uh, things are going sideways in the land of Israel. Uh, so let's get into 1 Kings 14 then. We'll read the first five verses. So you can play or pass, read as much as you feel comfortable with. Chris, will you uh, play or pass, get us started, read as much as you'd like. At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, became sick. And Jeroboam said to his wife, Arise now and disguise yourself so that they may not know that you are the wife of Jeroboam, and go to Shiloh. Behold, Ahijah the prophet is there, who spoke concerning me that I would be king over this, this people. And take ten loaves with you, some cakes and jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what will happen to the boy. And Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose and went to Shiloh, and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were dim because of his age. Now the Lord had said to Ahijah, Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam is coming to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. You shall say thus and thus to her, for it will be when she arrives that she will pretend to be another woman. Wouldn't be a Bible class in First Kings if we didn't ask someone to read some difficult yeah, names. No. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, so Ahijah. Um, there's a few names that are really close together. So there's Ahijah, this guy, who's a prophet. Uh, there's Elijah, there's mm -hmm. Elisha, and there's also going to be an Abijah as well. So if that's not confusing, uh, I don't know what is because yeah, it's, exactly. it's difficult. Um, what stands out to you initially in those first five verses? Uh, he, was, that she, he told her to go and uh, pretend she's someone else. Yeah, and that gets to the, the first question. Um, why did Jeroboam send his wife to Ahijah in disguise? And remember, Ahijah is the prophet that God sent to Jeroboam uh, initially. And uh, 
to tell him that he would get the 10 northern tribes of Israel. There's uh, the event where he's walking and takes his cloak off, tears it into 10 pieces, tells Jeroboam, take 10 of these. Uh, they're going to be your, your kingdom. Uh, so why do we think uh, Jeroboam sent his wife to a high gym disguise? Sorry to cut you off. Joseph. Well, she would be recognized, I guess, by the public or, or, or other people. And, um, you know, he didn't want to draw so much attention to it. Okay. Yeah, not wanting to draw attention to it. Maybe like if in the last chapter he is worshiping false gods, then he is going to be sending his wife to the prophet of the true God. That's some discrepancy there. I don't know if that's all related. But... Hmm. And if he thinks that, well, maybe he, like, like Ken is saying, if he thinks Ahijah has connections with the Lord, then maybe, and he knows his son is ill, then maybe he's hoping for healing or, you know, or he's heard that maybe he could do something about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think all those are very realistic possibilities and they all, they all play into this. It, it's, it's clear that he knows this prophet of God has some sort of special connection to the spirit world. Um, it's always confusing whenever we see people worshiping more than one God, you know, what, what do they really think? Um, it, it seems that he realizes he's guilty of sinning, though, otherwise he wouldn't have sent his wife and he wouldn't have sent her in disguise. Um, you know, it wasn't atypical for someone in high standing to go to a prophet. If you think of Naaman, uh, I think that's later on in Second Kings, um, he'll go to a prophet and he's, he's you know, high up commander. Uh, so it's not a, a strange occurrence, but he still seems to have this confusion uh, about the role of the prophet of the Lord. He knows he's something special, but also, and he knows he's guilty, but also he's not, you know, fully sold on, on worship of the Lord. Uh, well, let's keep going and see what else we learn about Jeroboam, and we'll see how the, the story unfolds. We'll read... Uh, Let's read verses six through nine, and we'll hear the beginning of Ahijah's response. So Olivia, player pass, pass. Sounds good. Hannah, player so pass. So when Ahijah heard the sound of her footsteps at the door, he said, come in, wife of Jeroboam. Why this pretense? I have been sent to you with bad news. Go and tell Jeroboam that this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I raised you up from among the people and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I tore the kingdom away from the house of David and gave it to you, but you do not, or, but you have not been like my servant David, who kept my commands and followed me with all his heart, doing only what was right in my eyes. You have done more evil than all who lived before you. You have made for yourself other gods, idols made of metal. You have been aroused. You have aroused my anger and turned your back on me. Before the Lord, so this is question number two, before the Lord told Jeroboam's wife what happened, he first rebuked Jeroboam sharply. Why was Jeroboam so wicked? It says he's done more evil than all who have lived before him, which is pretty bad. Not, <laughs> not the brand that you want to get. <laughs> Which is, you know, goes hand in hand. If you don't have God in your life, you, 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 you know, that goes hand in hand. I mean, it says he made other gods, but other people did too. So he must have done it a lot and was extreme about it because it says you've done more evil than all of them lived before you. Mm -hmm. So he must have been doing whatever that was to like an extreme. Yeah. And we'll, we'll see that there's a sort of repetitive cycle where. Uh, you know, someone will live, they'll be doing the most evil. And then, you know, a few kings later, now they've done the most evil. A few kings later, now they've done the most evil. And you just, you just pile up the, the, the vileness. Uh, Jeroboam is still going to the Lord. And we'll see kings who uh, won't even do that down the line. And if you just think of what Jeroboam has received from God, uh, he wasn't really anyone special. And then God appeared to him and Gave him the, the 10 northern tribes of Israel. This was more than a normal person could ask for in physical blessings. 
but Jeroboam has not been faithful in uh, serving the Lord and using his power for good. Instead, he's been using his, his newfound power to push for false gods. Um, other things in that section that you find interesting, other comments? Well, what was his, what was his backstory? Was there something he was angry about? Like specifically that was making him act out? Are you referring to Jeroboam? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, in regards to doing the evil things that you've yeah. been doing? Like, did he feel, I mean, he obviously, or I don't know, maybe he was raised that way. <laughs> yeah, so it all kind of gets started with the golden calves incident. Okay. So there's uh, Jeroboam's got the northern tribes, Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, he's got the southern two tribes, basically <clears throat> Jerusalem and south and Jeroboam doesn't want his people to go down and worship at Jerusalem because the people of Israel have been told three times a year you have to go to Jerusalem and have these festivals but Jeroboam thought well if people keep going down to Jerusalem what if they turn away what if they you know flip sides uh, so he set up these two false gods so it, that's kind of the starting point um he made, sort of paranoia. he made new priests out of anybody Mm -hmm. just like anybody who wants to can do like he was like the politician of the worst kind like just like handing out jobs like whatever you don't have to qualify you don't have to be of the tribe of Levi we'll just if you want to do it you can do it just yeah making new festivals new priests just making up stuff out of nothing to be popular probably I yeah. guess yeah and I keep thinking of uh you know when Joshua led the Israelites into Canaan they stamped out a lot of the, the pagan kind of stuff but then Solomon brings it all back in Mm -hmm. and apparently keeps it and so it's there as you know something that the kings keep falling into yeah yeah and it'll be surprising when kings push back against the pagan ideas mm -hmm. uh, and to what you said veronica I, it's so interesting that the kings will start to do a little more politicking mm -hmm. uh, as times go on and they'll start making alliances and stuff yep the people of Israel requested a king. They wanted to look like the other nations, and they start to do that. They start to lose their relationship with the Lord in the process. Um, one of the things, the thing is that, uh, can you hear me? Yep. We're well, real good. Okay. I, yeah, good. I, um, I think that's the thing about Jeroboam is he was always like a populist leader. Like he, he came in as the choice of the people who were angry at Rehoboam about you know, his, like, they're like, you were suffering under you, Ray of Bowman, what are you going to do? Well, I'm going to make it worse. Like, we're, we're voting for the other guy. And uh, he looked at it and he said, what am I going to do to keep these people around? And it's kind of the danger of, of not having a royal pedigree or a history or anything like that, is you're contingent on the people continuing to like you. So he's like, what are people going to like? Well, maybe they'll like not having to travel so far to go to church. Right. <laughs> And it makes me think, what are the things in our lives that can fall into a similar category of temptation? Uh, not that it's something that happens all at once, um, but little things, things of, of mm -hmm. convenience at first. Um, I don't know, just something interesting, I guess, to, to think about. Any other comments uh, on that point? All right, we'll keep slugging through. We'll get to the meat of the prophecy now. Uh, we'll do verses 10 through 16 then. So Paulina, play or pass? Play. Because of this, I am going to bring disaster on the house of Jeroboam. I will cut off from Jeroboam every last male in Israel, slaves or free. I will burn up the house of Jeroboam as one burns dung until it is all gone. Dogs will eat those belonging to Jeroboam who die in the city, and the birds will feed on those who die in the country. The Lord has spoken. As for you, go back home. When you set foot in your city, the boy will die. All Israel will mourn for him and bury him. He is the only one belong, belonging to Jeroboam who will be buried, because he is the only one in the house of Jeroboam in whom the Lord, the God of Israel, has found anything good. The Lord will rise 
raise up for himself a king over Israel who will cut off the family of Jeroboam. Even now, this is being beginning to happen and the Lord will strike Israel so that it will be like a reed swaying in the water. He will uproot Israel from the, this good land that he gave to their ancestors and scatter them beyond the Euphrates River because they aroused the Lord's anger by making Asherah poles. Mm -hmm. And he will give Israel up because of the sins Jeroboam has committed and has caused Israel to commit. Harsh words. Yeah. Uh, harsh prophecy. You, you, you come to the prophet and you just want to know, will my son die? And uh, things are going to be worse than just this. Um, we'll start with that then. What great judgment would befall Jeroboam? Well, wipe out his family. <clears throat> well, all the males. Mm -hmm. Apparently, the men are the problem. Huh. <laughs> I was waiting for yeah. <laughs> That was said just for you. <laughs> That's never true anymore. <laughs> I think you're right, though. I, there's the leadership is yeah. deteriorated. Yeah. Didn't say anything about women and children. Mm -hmm. He says um, slave or free. Like, he's like, he means business. Like there's going to be no mistaking. Well, anybody, nobody's going to be able to really say, oh, well, this is the one survivor. You know, like mm -hmm. he's like, no, nope, I'm going to take this gift that I have given you away from your entire line, really. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I don't, we don't always get how important that was. Just the, the lineage. Uh, right. Reading through First Kings, you almost have to put on your, your, uh, you know, ninth century Jewish reading lenses and <laughs> what does family mean to me? What is, you know, my connection to my ancestors? You know, how far can I trace it back? I know that I can't, I can't go back much more than a hundred years. Uh, if you can, I mean, more mm -hmm. power to you. That's great. These people could, you know, and that's utterly humiliating too, because again, the, the, uh, the family line was supposed to be passed through the mail, right? Exactly. Whether or not that's biologically, so that's the, the way that they treated it. And so to wipe out all the males was to basically destroy, him, you know. It's like to make him as though he never actually was. Mm -hmm. That's really intense. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. We don't always get a good sense what that would mean. Uh, this would be a devastating prophecy to, mm -hmm. to hear. Um, uh, and it's self inflicted. Ultimately, yeah. Jeroboam had every opportunity to make his family line into the great kings of Israel line. That's what the Lord promised him. Um, again, going back to when he took those 10 pieces of the robe and got to keep them. It was all contingent on if he kept the will of the Lord. And if he did that, well, God was going to keep blessing him. And he didn't. Uh, it's this horrible prophecy. Uh, it, I'm sorry. I just think about usually when when the Lord speaks and he says something like this, it's also amazing to me that sometimes there's just that that bit of still grace there that he gave for his son. You know, this is the only bit of good that I see. You know, so you have this really horrible prophecy and then he does offer this grace for the son that they really actually came there to talk about mm -hmm. right and to hope for so i mean as far as he'll be buried you mm -hmm. know and that's the only good that was in your home like he still um had that kind of grace in that moment mm -hmm. or sometimes he offers a way out for some people i don't know yeah who repent i guess mm -hmm. I think your choice of words, grace, that's just mm -hmm. not something you'd think of when you, when you hear your this. son is going to yeah. die. And yeah. I'm just curious if we want to dive into that a little bit more. What do, we, what do you mean by, you know, grace for allowing a son to die? Well, and I feel like that can be an open yeah, question, too. He's, you know, he, he could have said, well, you know, I guess people usually care for their sons, like if they care for no one they usually will care for their children, you know? And so here's Jeroboam trying to like 
reach out because of his son. I don't know if they would have come for anything else, you know, mm -hmm. um, because he's sending her in disguise as a risk. Who knows? But she, but he does say he'll die, but he's not going to be, you know, the, the things he described of what happened to everyone else were awful. <laughs> and he still says, you know, I'm going to let him be buried. Like, and now that, that can be huge. Yeah, I think uh, I like what you said too with Grace because I can think of two two things. Like, well, first of all, he's not going to live to suffer the right. horrible exam, you know, which is which is actually in certain periods of history that's actually a good thing. Yeah, to be there, right? Yeah. And then there's also the sense of of the burial because I think to uh, I think back to Antigone, how you know the whole the, the play Antigone where you have one brother is buried but the other is not. They're leaving him up there for you know for wild animals to devour it's like an utter utter profane mm -hmm. desecration right and mm -hmm. so there's he's allowed to keep some sense of, of sacredness by being actually married so mm -hmm. right yeah. but, and he's the, really good. Yeah, the boy was the only the only thing good that god's seen in you know in all this and so you know like she said i mean the, the boy he didn't have to go through everything else after and he didn't have to live to become what his family line had become. You know? Yeah, that's true. So sometimes there's grace in that. Yeah, that's a point I had that's a good point thought of. Yeah, yeah, and eventually he probably would have. I mean, you know, because, you know, you know, it's taught, you know, parents teach, you know, mm -hmm. their children, you're teaching them things when you don't realize you're teaching them. So, mm -hmm. and once you get that power too. Boy, is it hard to remain faithful to God? Yeah. yeah. Huh. And it doesn't say what the illness was. Mm -hmm. So in taking his life, he wouldn't have to suffer through whatever the illness was. That's what I was yeah. thinking. Yeah. That's true. Yeah, exactly. you, you never know what the path would have been otherwise. Mm -hmm. Health-wise, suffering, you know. It's hard to think about that, I think, as a, as a parent, period, mm -hmm. you think about that. I do think that God does have a plan. He does um, some amazing things in tragedy. Mm -hmm. so. huh. Sometimes that can be hard to see when we're mm -hmm. caught up in the middle. So it takes true. us looking back. Yeah, yeah. so you true. Twenty nine hundred years later, to be able to say, "Okay, that was right." Because <laughs> really quite like merciful. Saying, this looks savage. <laughs> it looks yeah. like God it is coming is. for you, and He does not play. Um. <laughs> it's true it, it's interesting reading through first kings and second kings uh the whole point of the book is this call to repentance you've sinned you've watched your ancestors sin you haven't turned your lives around uh, repent right but even in this book of strong law of strong calls to repentance you do see god's grace still in there uh, still in the story and um uh, it's not as announced as it is in other books of the Bible. Uh, like we were doing Philippians before we, we got into first Kings. Mm -hmm. That's just a book that's full of God's grace, right? But even here, we do see a gracious God who loves this boy, who uh, seems to have faith in the Lord, and, and he gets spared these horrible consequences of, of his father's downfall. Any other thoughts to that point or people online, please also feel free to, to jump in, share your thoughts as well. Um, did we get the questions? Yeah. Don't all these uh, kings and all these people, don't they always get warm, warned uh, by a prophet or one way or another? I mean, I, I know they have the law for sure. They should know better, but mm -hmm. it seems like usually some prophet tries to warn them, you know, if you don't repent, God's going to, you know, destroy you. There will be some terrible consequences if you don't repent. Mm -hmm. but it seems like that's pretty common is they usually get a, a prophet will actually tell them verbally to their face, you have to stop. Yeah. So that's grace by itself. It is. Yeah. I mean, God doesn't have to warn you. You should already know you have, you have the law, you know, technically. Mm -hmm. So I always thought reading I used to slog through the Old Testament and go, gosh, this is just one story after another. Yeah. This guy was bad, and then this happened. This guy was kind of good, and then this guy was bad, this happened. Mm -hmm. But 
it's the same patterns. There's almost always some prophet that warns them. You know, there's always one or maybe two prophets who are really prominent that are always, you know, speaking for God. And I presume they're always giving warnings. They're always there to reinforce what the law already says. So mm -hmm. it, it seems like God doesn't need to do that necessarily, but he, he does. They get an extra chance. They have somebody that actually shows up and says, you know, thus and so, thus says the Lord. You yeah. know, they have the law. They can read it if they want to. Mm -hmm. um, that's just observation. Yeah, that's a neat, op neat observation. And we get to be prophets now today and, and warn people about their sins, which isn't always easy. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> Nobody wants to hear that. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sure that Ahijah didn't want to be speaking these words of condemnation to one of the most powerful people in the land, <laughs> uh, the wife of the king. Um, but he did because that, that was God's word. And that was more important than anything he thought or feelings of fear. Feelings of trepidation, I think it's a good example for us too. Um, so question four, what further judgment did God threaten and why? I don't think we've quite covered that. Well, the boy was going to die and then Jeroboam was going to be completely cut off. Mm -hmm. Yep. And it also says in verse 16, he'll give up, he'll, and he will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam he's committed and caused Israel to commit. So it sounds like all of Israel's in trouble too. Yeah. Or the language from verse 15, he will uproot Israel from this good land. Yeah. Pointing ahead to the exile, the scattering of the northern tribes. Maybe also foreshadowing Judah going into captivity as well. Yeah. Um, well, let's uh, let's keep any other questions. Uh, so we'll keep moving. I have one, but we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, because I glanced forward. <laughs> <laughs> Cheater. No. Yeah. Well, you said we hadn't gotten to it yet, so I scanned through real quick. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. It got good, right? Yeah. Uh, let's keep reading then. Uh, let's do verses. Uh, 17 through 20, finish off this account. Uh, Joseph, play or pass? Not play. Then Jeroboam's wife got up and left and went to Tirza. As soon as she stepped over the, the threshold of the house, the boy died. They buried him, and all of Israel mourned for him. As the Lord had said through his servant, the prophet Ahi Ahijah, the, others, the other events of Jeroboam's reign, his wars, and how he ruled are written in the book of the annals of the king of Israel. He reigns for 22 years and then rests with his ancestors. And Nadab, his son, succeeded him as king. How did the Lord begin to carry out his judgment on Jeroboam? Boy died. Just as just as said. Yep. Yep. Wife enters the house, boy dies. Sad, mm -hmm. sad. I mean, you know, it's a sad circumstance. Mm -hmm. You know, she right when she gets there, which is what he said. Mm -hmm. So he's fulfilling what he's told. Absolutely. Yeah. And this is the you know, the first stone of many to fall, which is grace in itself, that it starts small, still time to repent, still time to turn back to God. Um, yeah. uh, any thoughts in particular from this section? Otherwise, we'll get into the yeah, if, questions. Yes. If all the males in this house died, uh -huh. then how did his son take over? Um. All the males will die, though the prophecy isn't fulfilled until a couple okay. kings later. Yeah, like a couple by Okay. Baash, I believe, is the one who wipes out his family line, uh, which is in First Kings 15. Okay, that's so why there, I was a little confused. Yeah, yeah so not immediately fulfilled. Takes is a while. suffering that's happening? You know, like, is it a gradual thing? I guess we'll learn. 
read. It's like COVID. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, gradual. Uh, it'll be a pretty immediate wiping out of the oh, whole family in yeah. one fell swoop. Okay. Yep. Uh, I guess I'm asking for the end. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. I don't know if we'll get there today, but. Like, uh, <laughs> yeah, I was looking at it. will happen. We got a couple of kings to go through. God did not say two weeks to fucking <laughs> Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, it'll be interesting because the person who carries out this prophecy, also wicked. The person who carries out the prophecy also gets their family wiped out as well. Oh, so yeah. it's, uh, yep. It's. It's horrible. This is this is sin. Why um, don't they repent? Sin is not when good. They learn. I mean, why, why don't they, they, they see it happening time and time again? I know. Why I say not? the same thing for myself. That reminds yeah. me of Pharaoh. <laughs> yeah. Well, well you, you think yeah. about how many family members did, you did, did, yeah. that go through the things they go through, and and you as you know you you're saying, hey, you're, these are the things you shouldn't be doing, and, and they're not going to listen to you because you're just a family member, and they just you know, and they and they're just hard headed, and they're just going to keep doing it, you know, mm -hmm. and so. You don't why you don't know why they don't learn from their mistakes, but they keep doing it over and over and over. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Maybe it's to maybe it's the original lie. You should, thou shalt not surely die. I mean, yeah. Maybe maybe one hears that. Maybe these guys would think that nah, it's gonna happen to me, and then right. I, did, right. you know, I mean, I can't imagine. Why it didn't work. Mm -hmm. hmm. Everything kind of seems to gravitate back towards those original temptations. Uh, be like God. Trust me, you won't die. Yeah. Yeah, maybe they thought they were invincible. It's it's always so interesting because he gets signs, he gets prophecy, the prophecy starts to come true. Uh, and I, I I appreciate what you said, Paulina. Like, why why do I keep messing up? We know that God can work good in our lives even in spite of our sin but uh, sinning is is not the the right course of action it's not the godly thing god is going to bless our godly living and and our following of his instructions he has not made the same promise towards our sins um, and yet we still keep doing them and we know the results we, we know the result is is death for us and we just do it anyway and, mm -hmm. and it's the frustrating thing about reading through First Kings. It's also a frustrating thing if you read through the book of your life too, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, and we're thankful that there's still gospel in there because Jesus does come and he's forgiven our sins, even the repetitive ones that we keep doing and the times we fail to learn from our mistakes. And, but we need to keep trusting in him. A absolutely. Otherwise, we'll endure the same fate that Jeroboam does. Um, let's go to that apply. Oh, any other questions? Looking ahead anymore. Uh, <laughs> 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 got enough in front of us today. Yeah. Uh, so question number six, then uh, agree or disagree. No one will receive God's blessings. If he like Jeroboam remains impenitent. Pastor wrote this didn't. <laughs> uh, this is uh, part of a, a series okay. that, that we have. Trade yeah. yeah. Well, it depends, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, it depends on what his what God's bigger plan is. Maybe he's going to bless you even though you know, yeah, you're a piece of crap, you're like bad, but he's going to bless you anyway because he's he's aiming for the folks on the other side of you, for the people around you, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll get your own, you'll get yours when you, you know, pass away or whatever. Mm -hmm. that's, cr that's crudely put, but you know. Oh. Point taken, absolutely. Yeah. Depends on what you're referring to as blessings. Yeah. And that's true. Too. All right. There's all yep, there's always the, <laughs> the little because I point believe, of the trick question. I believe scripture yeah. says something about that God blesses the evil and the uh, the righteous. Yeah. We we all get the sunshine, we all get the rain. Yep. Uh, yeah. you may get your daily provisions, but if you're talking about blessings as far as eternal salvation, then you're talking something completely different. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, it, the, the blessings to me is like a general term. Yeah. So it's kind of a trick question. Yeah. To make us talk. Yep. <laughs> it's working. You're talking, Chris. <laughs> Definitely a trick question. Uh, it's one of the one of the interesting features that I find about the books of, of Kings is it really doesn't mention any 
information about the king's lives except what is specifically germane to the conversation or, or the writing. Uh, it says they're wicked and, you know, they do evil in the eyes of the Lord and uh, that's about it. And then they die. And you say, well, this is so many years of history that are not recorded uh, because from God's point of view, it doesn't matter if they, you know, amassed a great military or, or won victories or, you know, they got more gold for the palace. It's not the point. The point is they're doing this without God. Political success is only a blessing if political success is a tr or is also in addition to forgiveness and salvation and, uh, you know, life with God. So it's just an interesting feature of Kings. How about the, we'll see if this one's also a trick question. <laughs> uh, true or false? Nothing harm. That's a harmless question, right? True or false? Uh, when God takes Christian children from this world in death, it is an act of his mercy, not his judgment. And we saw this you know, play out in this story. How about we'll start with someone online. We'll open up the floor to, to someone online. I feel like we've been doing a lot of talking here. I want to include you folks as well. I think you were saying as well. <laughs> Volunteering someone else. To... <laughs> and if nothing's coming online, that's okay too. Actually, like... okay. Well, let me, I can't answer this either true or false. And the reason why is we don't know why God takes Christian children in death. We don't know. We don't know. Is it because we don't know anybody's death? You know, when, when he's going to take anyone home even children. So how do we know? I mean, yeah, probably in his mercy. Yeah. I mean, he's taking them home to be with him, but I don't know. I can't, I can't answer this either true or false. That's the wisest answer possible. <laughs> yeah. So it was D. D. It was <laughs> true or false question answer. It was D. All the yeah. Asking someone to get into the mind of God is, is going yeah, to be exactly an impossible question. question. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that you, if we know that, you know, God is working for the good, then we, we don't know exactly what his mission was, but we do know that he has, there is good that is behind it. Do you know what I'm saying? So. Mm -hmm. It's kind of interesting too it mentions christian children not just all children mm -hmm. so whether it's an act of judgment or mercy he's taking them home mm -hmm. which is a blessing right either way right is god ever not mercy there's a thought-provoking mm -hmm. question is god ever not merciful? thoughts all the time yeah Yep. He's he's merciful when he's even in his judgment, whether whether it's a something you think is great or not great, it's there's mercy somewhere. All all things to the greater good, right? Mm -hmm. His good. I had a pastor point out to me once that like there is nothing in God's traits that is a result of other of God's traits. Like, God is not merciful because he's loving. God is not loving because he's just, right? Like, everything God is, he is fully and has always been fully. And so I think the thing is, is when we're thinking about mercy or judgment, like, we, we partition it the way we think about, like, oh, I used to like this person, but now I know that they're actually really this. And God is never partial like that. Like, he's never divided and um so as i look at this my my first thoughts are like would we say that there's a point where well like is it it's merciful to take children and death but not adults christian adults or i think i heard someone in the room mention like is it only christian children as opposed to other children like there's a lot of ways that the, the question is kind of like broken and i know that's the point like it's it's intended to provoke the thought but um, it's a fragile thing to be saying that like whenever uh, someone dies that that's mercy God is always merciful but I don't know like it's really easy to get yourself into a space of 
Um, I'm doing this guy over. <laughs> I'm doing the Lord's work, uh, killing this person <laughs> or something like that. Yeah, and that is something we obviously want to avoid. And mm. uh, people, there's been a bigger push in more modern history for things like euthanasia, well, mercy killing is even how some people phrase that. Mm -hmm. um, it is a dangerous thing to try and start to play God. Um, yeah. Yeah. Other thoughts on this topic? I think we could talk about God's mercy and God's <laughs> attributes all night though as well. Um, hey, this is Jenny. How are you? <laughs> Great. I just great. I just wanted to make a comment on number six. Yeah. I mean cool. number seven, sorry. Um I don't really believe that um children that God takes children, they die as a consequence of illness or accident, and then God takes them. But um, and that's from his mercy, but I just kind of thought that question, you know, he take God, when God takes Christian children from this world, I don't think he takes them from this world. I think this world causes their death and then he takes them. That's a good point. And I mean, because after all, we do live in a world of natural law and things can happen where a child dies without, you know, without us being able to say, well, God took the child. Mm -hmm. and I think, I don't know, I, it's so tempting to, to want to go off in different directions on that. But I remember what uh, the English poet John Milton said in the beginning parts of uh, the epic Paradise Lost, and that is that he wrote it to justify the ways of God to men. And of course, he failed part of way in doing that, right? It's a good poetry, but he wasn't able to do that. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that, you know, it's really easy for us to, to, to try and do that. And it's just not, it's not possible, you know, not from our limited understanding. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to acknowledge that we do have limited understanding. It's really difficult to speak in any kind of absolute, um, to speak it with, with definitive of knowledge. Uh, <clears throat> How do we know when death is God showing love and sparing a person suffering or, or uh, you know, a person might spin out of control in their faith. And so God takes them and they get to be with him. Or how do we know when it's just the result of sin in the world and it's just a, a natural consequence of that old Adam that we all have. And we don't have the answer to that question. Um, that, that's a, God thing, his reasons for doing everything we do know that um, a, a nice passage, uh, a comforting passage uh, that, that talks about this subject, the subject of death. Isaiah 57, verse 2, those who walk uprightly enter into peace, they find rest as they lie in death. And we know walking uprightly, th those who follow God, those who trust in God as their savior, they they find rest, whether it was a um, natural consequence of sin that a believer dies, whether it's God sparing them from suffering and taking them. From our point of view, it, it, it's hard to say the answer to that, but we know where they are. We know that they're resting with their father. They're, from an earthly point of view, uh, their death could have been painful and, and miserable, but now they have peace. Now feel free to... God is in control. Absolutely. Absolutely, Bob. God is in control. I think that was Bob. Yeah. He's, him being the, you know, he is the author of life. You know, he is, you know, like, you know, we, he knows the beginning to the end, right? So. In every detail. Right. Mm-hmm. And we praise him for that, uh, that he writes the, the plan for our life and guides us and has got us uh, in the shadow of his wing, mm -hmm. keeping us safe, mm -hmm. doing what's best for us. Vicar, doesn't it say somewhere in the Bible about um, our names being written in the book of life? We don't know the time of our death. Only God does. 
and that pertains to children as well. We don't know how long anyone's going to be on this earth. Um, only God knows when we're going to die. He knows the date, the time, the second, everything. We don't. Um, so whether it is an adult, a teenager, a child, a baby, you know, when God says it's time, it's time. We don't have a choice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, ultimately, we, we trust in God and know that he's loving and he's in control. And, uh, you know, we, we work with this framework of time that, that the rules of the world that we play by. Uh, but we know that God is not bound by, by time and he sees everything from his point of view and he knows what's best for us. And um, yeah, and we trust in a loving God, a caring God and yeah, there's there's more there's a lot that can be said with that um but we trust ultimately we trust in our father other thoughts all right let's uh spend 45 seconds write a quick summary of first kings 14 1 through 14 45 seconds plus as long as it takes me to get out the timer. <laughs> Uh, 15 more seconds. All right, who will share? Let's get two of them. I'll do one. All right, Kat. Um, for me, this is, this is the summary of the whole thing. God's in control, and if you disobey, he can take it all away. All right. All set, sis. <laughs> we'll give us one more quick summary. Don't mess with God. Don't mess with God. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Truthful statement there. Um, we'll see how far we get in this next one. Uh, maybe we'll try and finish up First Kings 14. That should be an attainable goal for us. Uh, sorry, we'll read... Um, Let's read the let's read first Kings 14, 21 through 24. Uh, Daniel will be to you. You can play or you can pass. I'll uh, play. Rehoboam, son of Solomon, was king in Judah. He was 41 years old when he became king, and he reigned 17 years in Jerusalem, the city the Lord had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel in which to put his name. His mother's name was Naamah. She was an Ammonite. Judah did evil in the eyes of the Lord. By the sins they committed, they stirred up his jealous anger more than those who were before them had done. They also set up for themselves high places, sacred stones, and Asherah poles on every high hill and under every spreading tree. There were even male shrine prostitutes in the land. The people engaged in all the detestable practices of the nations the Lord had driven out before the Israelites." You see the note on the top, um, according to Second Chronicles 11, Rehoboam seems to have had a good beginning. He followed God's law, fortified the cities, set domestic affairs in order, organized the priests. However, this only lasted for three of his 17-year reign. Um, recall Rehoboam, this is the son of, oh, says son of Solomon right now. Perfect. Uh, what was the spiritual condition of Judah under Rehoboam? Evil. Really bad. Evil. Really bad. Yeah, the, the leader's guide for this section said Solomon had trained Israel well. Uh, not a good thing when it's referring to idolatry. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, we have the tendency to do as our, our parents have done. It's hard to break the cycle. And Rehoboam starts off well, and uh, things don't go as God would want. Uh, starts acting just like Jeroboam acts, start giving the people what they want, uh, 
some some idols, some some sacred stones, uh, taking the focus off the Lord. Anything in particular standing out to you in, in those section in that section? I think it's inter- interesting. It says that they stirred up uh, God's anger more than those who were before them had done. I'm wondering who the, those were. Is that like is that referring to the only the only the only people I can think of it would refer to is the, the Canaanites that lived there before. Yeah. So the so the, the people of Judah were actually worse than the pagans that they learned all that from. They were more degraded, more corrupted. Yeah, I'd have to stu- I'd have to look into it a little more. I think I think it more than likely it's referring to their ancestors, like yeah. uh, Israel's yeah. Yeah. ancestors. It's like more than if you think of like the rebellions that take place during the Exodus. And, Speaking against Moses, this is worse. Well, one could have wished for something other than an indefinite pronoun. Yes. In the end, but that's just yes, that flaw, flaws of translating and uh, yeah, that, that can also happen. Uh, nothing's perfect. No. Uh, no, no translation is perfect. That's why we should all learn Hebrew, right? Yeah. Who's on board? <laughs> yes. See lots of smiling faces, lots of people online. Yes. Okay. Very nice. Well. Next week, come back. We'll come be back. starting Hebrew <laughs> lessons. Uh, I'll get it. You can start start with the alphabet. We'll work up from there. No, okay. No takers. No. Um, let, let's keep going. Let's do the rest of the verses. Uh, 50, uh, 25 through 31. Veronica, we're up to you. You can play or pass. Oh, In the fifth year of King Rehoboam, Shishak, king of Egypt, attacked Jerusalem. He carried off the treasures of the royal palace. He took everything, including all the gold shields Solomon had made. So King Rehoboam made bronze shields to replace them and assigned these to the commanders of the guard on duty at the entrance to the royal palace. Whenever the king went to the Lord's temple, the guards bore the shields and after they, afterward they returned them to the, guards, to the guard room. As for the other events of Rehoboam's reign and all he did, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? There was continual warfare between Rehoboam and Jeroboam. The Rehoboam rested with his fathers and was buried with them in the city of David. His mother's name was Naamah. She was an Ammonite. And Abijah, his son, succeeded him as king. What's initially sticking out to you in this section? There's nothing but conflict, right? Mm-hmm. The, the conflict between the two houses and, and the king of Egypt came and stole all their stuff because they can have their you know, stuff together. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> in a world with some pretty big superpowers, uh, you leave God, you become one of those little fish in the pool with a bunch of sharks. Yeah. Um, yeah. What impression do you get of Rehoboam's rule from the account of Shishak's pillaging of the temple? Uh, so we started to discuss that. How about from the account of the bronze shields as well? Well, the, the temple was made of all this, this pre, these precious items, you know, the gold and, and, and all of that. Um, I've been reading Leviticus and the building of all of this stuff, and it, it's just amazing. To me, um, they took all of this precious stuff from from the Lord's temple. They took it all. And when Rehoboam put this bronze shield, bronze is more of a, a lesser class type of metal. So he built second best um, to put in the place of the gold that was actually taken from the temple. Mm-hmm. I remember back when we were talking about mm-hmm. Solomon and they said silver was worthless because they, they had so much gold. Uh, times have changed in the land of Israel. Uh, now they've got these bronze shields. And it's strange, you know, the, the gold shields that Solomon made, they're just decorative. It, it's just strange to me. Now they're, now they're keeping guard with the shields. They seem to be using them for protection, potentially. Hard to say, but... Um, yeah, times are different now in Israel. Uh, other thoughts from, from this section, the reign of Rehoboam? All right. Uh, 
I think this is probably a pretty solid starting point before we get into another king. Um, <laughs> we can only handle so many names yes. at a time okay. and so many people. Uh, we'll close with prayer then. Any uh, additional prayer requests then? Things that have come to your mind since the beginning of our time together? Just giving thanks to God for working in our lives. All right, let's pray then. Heavenly Father, you give us all good things and you give it at the proper time. Uh, tonight, you gave us the opportunity to gather with other Christians and learn more about you and your word. Uh, Lord, we heard some difficult accounts tonight, uh, accounts of struggle and of sin. Uh, Lord, remind us of your glory. Remind us of the forgiveness that each of us have, have received from Jesus. Uh, and Lord, just thank you for working in each of our lives each day. Uh, sometimes it's difficult. We, we run into hardships and the, the path isn't clear, but we know that you're guiding us and you're holding us by the hand. And ultimately, we too will get to rest in peace with you all our days. Uh, Lord, bless us uh, the rest of today and throughout the rest of our week. Help us stay connected to you and your word. All this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.